Welcome back to the Procession series. In the first episode of the Procession series, we discussed that there were other models to account for Procession not being the wobble of Earth's axis. So in this episode, we will discuss Walter Cruttenden's research on Procession and his idea that this cycle is linked to what is called the Great Year or the Yuga Cycle. This is an area that I would like to explore in more detail. The connections and evidence that ancient civilizations were aware of this knowledge and have attempted to encode it in a way to preserve it for future generations. I would also like to explore any evidence on how changes in our solar system environment could have such a dramatic effect on human consciousness. But all of that is for a future episode. So please enjoy my discussion with Walter Cruttenden. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a big warm welcome to Walter Cruttenden, who's the author of The Lost Star and the man who pioneered the concept of our processional cycle being linked to a binary star. Now, Walter, I recently uh, read your book, and to be honest, it's partly shame on me that I've never actually come across your book earlier. Um, but reading it, to be honest, I, I got so much inspiration from some of the work and some of the things that you put in there were like little dots that connected for me that I, I actually hadn't seen that before. So for me, starting point is, is how on earth did you become interested in both archaeology and, and astronomy? Well, it goes way back uh, when I was a child. Um, my mom gave me a lot of books on ancient cultures and I just uh, ate them up. And then I remember being in a history class and uh, I had a pretty good knowledge of ancient history already, and I was maybe in the fifth or sixth grade, and uh, they were talking about Columbus coming to the US, uh, America, and I said, well, why didn't they come earlier? They certainly had boats, we know that, and my history teacher said, well, they just didn't have boats that were big enough, and it was a very dangerous journey. And I thought, well, that's possibly logical, although I did read the, you know, the Viking ships were much larger, but so I filed that away. And about a year later, I'm reading National Geographic magazine, and they're talking about nine ships that they'd found buried under the Giza Plateau near the Great Pyramid there. And um, the, the, the ship of Khufu there, they is twice the length of Columbus's ship and it's 4,500 years old, not just 500 years old, nine <laughs> times distance. So then I started thinking, okay, well, maybe even school doesn't have all the right facts on history. And it led me to, it led me to read a lot more about it. And then, you know, if uh, you read about Egypt a lot and some of the ancient cultures, you find their fascination with the sky. And uh, so you, you do start to connect the two uh, especially when you get into some of the older myths. Um, but if I had to point at one thing, it would probably be a book written in 1894 by Swami Sri Yukteswar. He's an Indian saint astronomer, and it's called The Holy Science. And it's he's really talking about uh, the similarities between religions. But at the very beginning, the reason he says there's so much divisiveness right now and the reason why this subject might be difficult to understand is because we're in a, a lower age and that is caused by our the motion of our solar system relative to another star. And I thought, whoa, hold on. There's a whole new way to explain history. I hadn't heard. And so that led to this lifelong study. So, so was that sort of the point at which you sort of identified that is so different from what mainstream tells us um because it's you know i when i was younger i read uh you know a lot of um, sort of books about you know the the, the pyramids and the, the con those sorts of concepts and you know i found it fascinating but but you kind of went that one step further like you, you kind of took that and and sort of went no no there's still something wrong there's there's a gap here that needs to be sort of filled in what for you was that moment that you kind of went do you know what I, this this has got to be a journey of mine you know, it was intuitive. I, it's it's hard to know why we work on some things and other people work on other things, but it just is uh, 
you know, I've written books on the subjects. I've done 60 podcasts on the subject. I've, we're on our 11th conference on it. Uh, we did a children's book. We did the Great Year documentary with James Earl Jones. It's, there's something inside of me. It's almost like that movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know, where Richard Dreyfuss is <laughs> building this, this volcano or whatever it is, mountain, over and over again. He doesn't know why. And uh, same with me. It's just, it, this is, I think it's extremely important information that has to get out. So on what stage did you become aware of, of Homan's work? So let's see, uh, probably 15, 20 years ago or so. And so I took a trip up to Canada to meet uh, both Homans. Uh, uh, the, the senior Homan Carl was uh, still living at that time. And I, I really wanted to see firsthand his telescope, how it was positioned. I wanted to see his records and how he uh, timed the transits of Syria relative to his telescope on Earth. And uh, as as you probably know, um, it, it, the telescope is absolutely fixed. It's like welded and sandbagged and stuff like that. And it's 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 simply the Earth moving that makes it come around to Sirius every day. Uh, a, and that's a sidereal day, so four minutes difference uh, with each day. And uh, it was, so yeah, close to 20 years ago, and I was extremely impressed, and um, it sort of confirmed to me some of the mysteries of, of Sirius, that it didn't seem to show precession uh, like other stars uh, and like it would be expected to. So... Your first book came out in 2006, um, but you were actually involved in the CPAC back in 2004. So how did all of that sort of come about, the, the, the book and the CPAC? So initially, we, as this problem of ancient history and astronomy uh, started to grow, I just got together with more and more uh, scientists to study it. And I was looking for anybody I could. And uh, and so, yeah, we did call our first meeting in Vancouver, uh, our Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge One. And, uh, and then, yeah, it took me a while to sort of gather the thoughts. And I, I wanted to reach reach a larger audience just so I could get more feedback and input so I could solve this problem quicker. And uh, that's why we uh, came out with the book and, of course, did a series of conferences to, to get that input. So you, that's how, also how you met Robert Schock and, and Graham Hanker at these, these uh, CPAC events. Is that right? Y yes, very much so. And um, I, I was blown away when I read uh, Graham's book, you know, Fingerprints of the God, yeah. I, God's... It was almost intuitively written I, because he picked up on a lot of this stuff. And I know the BBC really <laughs> crucified him because he went so much against the uh, the paradigm of history at the time. And, you know, every fact in the book may not be right, but God bless him for, you know, going out there on a limb and saying this stuff is real. And he trekked all over the world to check it out. And so, yeah, and I almost think of... Uh, Lost Star is a prequel to uh, Fingerprints because he points out all this evidence and I'm just trying to find out why it exists. Why do you think we have such a, a distorted view of history? Because, you know, that was one of the things, you know, both in terms of Graham's work, but again, it was, for me, it became so much clearer when I read your book, is, is that idea that we have that the further back you look in time, the, the more stupid we almost become, you know. And, and I, I mean, I've 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 done some uh, some ones looking at uh, caveman, and and you look up, you just type in you know caveman in in a search engine, and you get this sort of you know like Barney Flintstone looking character, and <laughs> you know the reality probably is very different. So why do we have this view that, that that we can't have been more intelligent than we are now, or equally as intelligent? Right. So. Uh... You know, there's a couple of reasons. I think uh, I don't have all the answers, of course, but 
Uh, one is that um, we are in a relatively low age, if you believe in, in this cycle. And, uh, you know, we've just barely come out of the dark ages where all we could do was uh, interpret things through the five senses. And we had no knowledge of finer forces like, you know, everything's made of molecules and those are made of atoms and those are made of electrons and neutrons and protons and uh, no knowledge of magnetism or electromagnetism and all the different spectrums of light. And you go on and on and on. Uh, so we're, we're, we've kind of just come out of this super, super material age, barely entered the what the Greeks would call the Bronze Age or the Indians would call the uh, Dwapara Yuga, where you start to discover these these subtle particles and subtle forces. and um, But the paradigms of the big institutions take a while to change. You know, they, uh, whether it's banking or religion or government or big, strong beliefs, um, they, they just take a while. It's almost some scientist, I forgot who it was, said that, you know, science changes one dead scientist at a time. You kind of got to give up the old one before the <laughs> new one. But, and I think the procession problem was uh, particularly uh, entrenched because the, the word to explain the observable is the same word we use to explain the cause. And it's it's totally goofed up. It's mixed up. But uh, and and you know maybe one other reason is uh, is that uh, you know we're still at a at a time where the big institutions like the the Christian Church, you know, they said the Earth was only six thousand years old. You know, before that, nothing should have existed, and so. You look at even early history, the scientific history, they tried to squeeze it all into this 6,000 years. And finally, that broke down, you know, about the time of the Renaissance. It, it just geology and everything else didn't make sense if that was true. But there was, so we, we had a way to replace it with evolution. And then we want to stick to these things because it gives us some sanity. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, evolution shouldn't be so strict that anything that came before us must be more primitive. We should allow for cycles, just like during the year we allow for seasons. So, um, Well, and that, that, for me, when I read your book, was, uh, for me, one of those moments where you talked about the... Um, <laughs> you talk about why do we call it the month, the moonth, I think is what you refer to it in your book. And I'd never, honestly, I'd never sat down and thought about that. And for me, that was just such a, a beautiful analogy to the fact that everything in our life is a cycle. They're all, some of them shorter and some of them longer. And then obviously, if we look at the, the, the yuga cycle, that's obviously a, a hugely long cycle. Now, I haven't actually, you know, talked about the, the yuga cycle before. So can you give a very brief summary of of where the concept of the yuga cycle comes from and, and how the, the different ages change from the bottom to the top. Sure. Uh, very briefly, um, ancient cultures pretty much around the world uh, a thousand years ago or even up through much of the Dark Age uh, had, had their view of history and it was a cyclical view. It was just the common belief. And it, actually, Plato had a term for it. He called it the great year. And that, you know, sort of history would repeat itself over very long periods of time. Not exactly the same, of course, but um, it, it was strong. And it, we find evidence of it in at least 30 ancient cultures. Some some have put the number around 40, but uh, Giorgio de Santillana and Hertha von Deschen in their brilliant book, Hamlet's Mill, uh, documented many of these uh, references to uh, a great year and the ancient fascination with procession. They're almost watching procession like it's a clock, and it is a clock of, of this greater cycle. Um, so anyway, this uh, the, the yugas are simply... Uh, the yuga cycle is simply this 24,000 rough year period 
uh, of one precession cycle. And so it's maybe easier to understand from an astronomical point of view that, you know, in, in a single day, we see the uh, sun and the stars rise in the east and set in the west, and they go around us in 24 hours from our point of view. And of course, we realize it's now the Earth spinning that causes that observable. And in a single year, uh, we see each of the 12 constellations of the zodiac. We're just using them as marker points, just like we use numbers on a clock to tell time, um, go completely around us. And again, they're not going around us. It's a, some other motion of the Earth is taking place, this time not the Earth's rotation, but the Earth's revolution uh, that causes a different constellation to appear to be overhead roughly once a month. And then the final, the third motion of Copernicus, which he called libration, we know as procession today, uh, is takes roughly 24,000 years, uh, 25,720 years at the current rate, but it's affected by Kepler's law. And, uh, and that observable, we see the, the um, if we look, say, on a specific day, the equinox, uh, say the spring equinox, we'll notice that the same background stars are not in their exact same position at, on the equinox as you would expect if the, if the sun were going exactly 360 degrees around the Earth. And so uh, it's, it's sort of baffled people. And um, Copernicus said the Earth wobbled. Newton said, well, if it wobbled, it must be due to the gravity that I've discovered. And, and so, but his equations turned out, you know, not to work. People noticed after about 100 years and so they've added in all these inputs and uh, the whole thing's kind of broken down. But the the ancient uh, seem to have no issue with these things. They, they got into actually defining each of the phases of the great year. And so the Greeks are the ones that we know the best. They call the iron, bronze, silver, and golden age and gave us very clear characteristics, the age of man, the age of the hero, uh, the age of the demigods and the age of the gods. And then um, the Indians, they also have clear and deep descriptions of them, the Kali Yuga, the Dwapara Yuga, the Treta Yuga, and the Satya Yuga. And they talk about, you know, it's a time where man only knows himself to be a physical body, then he realizes himself to be much more made of energy. And then, you know, this demigod age is, Hollywood would say that's when a, a god marries a human, whereas the uh, saints and sages of India would say, no, that's when a human is actually be realizing that he is a god. And so he's he's halfway or two thirds of the way on his journey. And then, uh, of course, the, the golden age is so far beyond us, we have almost no way of understanding it now. But there's some beautiful myth and folklore about it. Well, and, and I think that's, so from some of the work that, that I've done looking at uh, procession, that the fact that there is so much information encoded in, in our myths, and, you know, we, we treat them nowadays as stories and, and fables, but, you know, reading your work and, and, you know, Hamlet's Mill really points to the fact that actually that information is encoded because, you know, when I read your book, one of the things that kind of sprang to mind was if, if I was in a golden age, and I knew that we were going to go down the cycle. How do I preserve this knowledge? How do I pass this knowledge on in a way that at some point, because, you know, you, you, you point out that, you know, the Dark Ages is linked to one of the worst times and in history it is the worst time, that, that you would want to somehow encode it in a way that when man is ready, that they can understand that knowledge. And you're, you're exactly right. And, you know, as parents... Uh, we we do this for our children. You know, they they don't know how cold winter's going to be, so we buy them winter clothes and and get them all ready and send them off to school. And uh, so yes, it's it would be a very natural thing to do to try to build structures that would help preserve knowledge or preserve some of the subtle effects that are occurring during a higher age and. And I think, yeah, a lot of this, uh, these great ancient structures, 
perform some of that function, although it's still a great mystery to me and others, although there are some cool theories about it. Yeah. But I, I guess, I mean, moving on to sort of the, the idea of, of, you know, the lost star, um, obviously you, you talked briefly about the fact that, that we know that the, when the, the Earth turns around the sun in each year, you know, there is a little bit extra. It turns a little bit more. And, you know, our current idea for the, the mainstream idea is obviously the fact that the axis wobbles. So over the 24,000 years, the, the, that wobble completes one circle. Now, obviously, there are a huge number of flaws in that analysis. And I think one of the main things that kind of struck me from, from your book is the idea that actually we, we follow a, a curved path. So the, the easiest way to explain our motion is, in fact, when you follow the curve, you have to turn a little bit further to, to make your way around that curve. Um, and, and you then took that and connected it to this idea of, of the, the binary star. So would you like to just talk a little bit about why... I mean, in your book, you don't necessarily allude to it has to be serious, but obviously that's one of the, the, the strong connections you, you, you try and make. Um, yeah, I try to try to be neutral in the book, and we say, you know, there's basically two potential things. It could be, uh, you know, a black hole or a brown dwarf or even maybe a red dwarf towards the galactic center, something very difficult to see or, you know, a failed supernova or something like that. Uh, and um, Or it could be a visible star, and maybe uh, there's some physics at work that we still don't understand. Um, and, you know, since I wrote that book, uh, a knowledge of uh, gravity waves has been proven, uh, which Einstein theorized in... Uh, what 1916 but in 2016 the LIGO experiment proved that gravity waves are real so you have uh, another mechanism to cause it um, but I guess the um, the point you're on so precession is this observable that we see uh, that we try to explain with a, a wobbling axis uh, but if we can separate that and just say, yeah, why is it that we see different stars uh, at the point of the equinox each year? Uh, slight, you know, it, it moves about 50 arc seconds per year, so it takes a long time, uh, 72 years roughly, to move one degree. Uh, and so uh, if we go back to the other explanations why we see different observables of the heavens, you know, the Earth spins on its axis, as we talked about, and we see all the stars go around us. So that that circular motion is caused by the Earth spinning. And we go to the second one, the why did the, the zodiac spin around us? Well, it's because the Earth goes around the, the sun. So it just seemed logical that if we see all the stars go around us in an even longer period of time, um, it's uh, probably due to some orbit that has still not been detected. And so that's that's how we get to this whole binary system idea that our solar system is gravitationally bound to another star and going around it. And, you know, when I wrote that book, uh, just trying to clarify Sri Yukteswar's ideas and having a little bit uh, this was totally laughable. Nobody was even looking for a, a mass bigger than Pluto out there. And then they started to find yeah. a few <laughs> dwarfs. And then uh, then they realized that all the dwarfs are inclined to the plane and they all have these elongated orbits. Then they realized, oh, the entire plane of the planets, these big heavy masses, Jupiter, uh, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus are pulled down six degrees to the plane of the sun's equator. And to explain all these things with different ideas creates a lot of problems for science. So they try to, you know, God bless them, at least they're looking at one thing. So they're looking for this huge mass, which uh, every telescope in the 
in the world right now is pretty much pointed in the direction of Orion between Sirius and the Pleiades, looking for whatever this ninth planet could be. So they can't even conceive that it could be something farther out, something greater mass. Uh, but at least they're looking for a big mass now. And so I feel somewhat vindicated that we're going in the right direction. Yeah, just just to clear up, I said it was the Earth, but it is, it is in, in your idea, it is the whole solar system that processes and it's the curved path that, that it follows that, that causes the, the difference in the, the movement and why, because if you imagine you're, you're following a curve all the way around, that's why you would see the changing of those constellations as you would arc around that, that giant curve. And, and I think for me, one of the things, because again, you, you, you linked very nicely that concept of the Yuga cycles and because a lot of people would look at the Yuga cycles and go, yeah, that's a story, you know, whatever, you know, okay, that's just showing progression. But obviously, you know, in a lot of their stories, they do talk about the fact that it repeats. It is a cycle and, you know, very adamantly they, they can, uh, you know, they, some of the times they give them names that each cycle has a, has a different names. I think the, the, um, uh, the Mayans, I think, had different names for it, how yeah, each they... of their worlds would, would end. And so that this concept that it repeats. And what I like particularly in, in your book was the idea that if it's serious, then, you know, we have, a, 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 okay, ignoring the fact that there is a problem with explaining how the gravities would work, but looking at the, the causal mechanism for that um, decline in our ability and then the return of our ability, in your book, you link that to, to our orbits or getting closer to Sirius and moving further away. And again, you, you talked in, in there about some of the research in terms of the effects that um, you know, magnetic waves and EM waves have on, on, on our brain and our ability to think. And even since then, you know, I've done a little bit of research, there are more people uncovering you know, the, the link between electromagnetic radiation and functions in the brain and you know um also uh, you know genetic mutations and 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 all these things i mean that to me is like a key of that's a mechanism that's a way of describing a mechanism that that fits the yuga cycle into the story of procession into this concept of up and down and up and down for our our mental abilities and our what we see in society so that for me struck a massive chord and, and, you know, joined many dots for me uh, when I read that in your book. Cool. Yeah. Uh, it is interesting how science gives us these wonderful analogies. Um, I, you know, I've read about uh, this uh, sad, uh, this seasonal uh, disorder where people don't get enough sun and they're depressed and, and down. And then there's other similar, uh, diseases, anxiety, and depression and stuff, and that can be um, mitigated with a TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is uh, some sort of pulsing of a magnet on the brain. And yeah, it, it may not be exactly the way the yugas work over a long scale, but at least the, the basic mechanism seems to be there. Our brains are affected by you know, non-physical things that we interact with, and uh, whether it's it's light or forms of magnetism or electromagnetism. So I, it's a wonderful time in, in history and science uh, in that there's so much to be discovered, and we're just on the very beginnings of that. But curve. then you look at it, and I looked at it and thought, wow, the golden age, that's that's so far away. You know, you'd like it to be just on your doorstep and it's not, but you're right. You know, we are at the point that we are starting to discover more and more about the way things work. We're still in a very naive phase, I think, in terms of our development. But one of the points as well in your book that, that also I found interesting is because, you know, looking at the ancient Egyptian records, they talk about, you know, their, their um, ancient uh, gods living for, for many hundreds and hundreds of years, which... You know, you'd look at today, and even in the Bible, you know, there, there are uh, ages were were much much longer, and you made that beautiful analogy between how long people lived in the in the Dark Ages, and then how long people live now, and that's already a, a massive increase, and yet that's only a very small move in that in that overall cycle. So, is it that crazy that we project it forward to? To, for it to be 
a hundred or two hundred or three hundred years? Yes, uh, you know, and, and it's what's so cool is that these records are all out there. The Chinese dynastic records. The farther back you go, the longer the dynasties are, and um, the kings list in Egypt. The farther back you go, the longer the kings are living or their kingdoms are are existing. And the Persian records, uh, and actually Newton noticed this, and uh, he was a very logical guy, and his explanation was, well, everyone just wanted to brag about how great their ancient civilizations were, so they all made up the same story. <laughs> but it's <laughs> that's almost more far-fetched than to believe that there could actually be a reason for it. And and you're right. In the Bible, you have Seth and Methuselah and Noah and all these people that lived to be long periods of time. All throughout uh, myth, you see it. You know, Hesiod himself was uh, considered the, the most uh, learned Greek historian of all time in, in the Greek literature, early Greek literature, until uh, he started talking about, you know, things like a golden age and stuff like this. And people really studied that and realized, well, there was no golden age. He, he must not be a historian. He must be a mythologist. And so they completely reclassify him to go with our current paradigm of what we think is right. And we're literally throwing the baby out with the bathwater in that sense. But, but if this is true, so if it is true that, that you know, th these cycles repeat over and over again and that effectively means that mankind is probably far older than than we think now obviously the question most people will ask is well where is that evidence then yes a great question by the way and uh you know that first came up um somebody asked me that uh before uh, the internet came along before there was any wireless uh, communication. And uh, the person I recall him saying, well, where are all the telephone lines and where are all this, all this wire we should be finding all over the place if they were so advanced, you know, uh, as if he got me. And then I said, well, you know, I don't know. Maybe they had different ways of doing things. And uh, sure enough, uh, Communities throughout the world are developing without any wires, you know, the wireless uh, technologies. Another thing that came up, uh, I went on one of these beach cleanup trips for our local community. It was fun. And and uh, I remember I grew up here in Southern California, and we all had Coke bottles. You know, you'd always bring a six-pack of Coke to the beach and uh, to cool off. And... Uh, and you know, people weren't as good as they should have putting these things in the trash. And so I remember there were a lot of Coke bottles on the beach. And so we went down for this cleanup, but it, it was like, you know, 20 years after Coke bottles had been used and we'd gone on other technologies. Couldn't find a single Coke bottle on the entire <laughs> beach. You know, we were digging in the sand and, uh, and digging in the hillside and everything. And so uh, things disappear. And I'm I'm not quite sure why, but and it could also be that we have different ways of doing things. Um, and so there's some wonderful uh, new archaeological uh, findings coming out about how ancient peoples did live. And one example I really like is is farming, you know. So if you're looking for evidence of advanced farming today, you'd say, well, where are the monocrops? Where are all the rows? And, you know, and uh, I just read this finding. Uh, it was in Asia of a farming area that they think is up to 40,000 years old. And it seems that crops are blended in uh, with the jungle. And and there's they, they have a really cool way of, you know, letting nature... Uh, just be a little freer, if you will, and not so controlled by man. And and they're finding that there's all sorts of benefits to this. There's somebody, a friend of mine, uh, Gary Evans, there in the UK, who does forest bathing, and he brings groups, 
people out to be around old trees. And he finds that the trees give off aerosols and uh, chemicals and things that we really need, that we are only learning that we need them now. And yet in chopping down trees, we've been hurting ourselves. And so I think in higher times, we live much more in tune with nature. And we're probably not going to find a lot of the things that we expect to find just because we don't have telepathy anymore. We expect, well, where are all the cell phones, you know? And there's different ways of doing things. Well, there is an interesting, and it's a little bit controversial, but there's a channel that I watched, uh, I think she's called New Earth, and she did a particular series um, looking at old uh, Google Earth uh, images, because apparently they've changed some of the feeds and some of it is not as clear as it used to be. And uh, she, I'll send you the link to some of the videos, but she goes through and identifies what look like roads massive long and they're not small roads they're like what you would consider to be like a six lane highway uh, across vast stretches of just abandoned countryside you know it's just in the middle of nowhere whether it's deserts or something and the more that she looks the, the more she finds all these crisscross patterns and i mean it could be natural formation you don't know but what is interesting is the, the concept that actually if you built a road then the majority of the road in, you know, when we were talking 12,000 years, let's say 12,000 years, what would be left? Probably not much of it. Maybe the fact that the <laughs> earth was slightly higher or taller, because all you're seeing on this is is obviously the fact that it's raised up above the, the rest of the land. And the rest of it's all gone. And she identifies structures underwater as well, which, okay, you don't know what they are, but the fact is that they've got very straight, rigid lines that you can see. So... Again, uh, it comes back to this idea is it, if we, if you looked at our society, what would be left of our society in 12,000 years time? And I suspect for our society, not much, because we're not particularly good at building anything. We're, we're good at building quickly, <laughs> but not something that lasts a long time. And I That's think very some, true. Some of the ancients yeah. maybe were better at it, but obviously we look at some things and we think that it's a mountain and it may not be, you know, that the whole Bosnia pyramid you know, there's a huge debate as to whether it is natural or, or man-made. Um, right. You know, and, and some of these, like Gobekli Tepe, the fact that they buried it, is that not purposely. an indication? Purposely. Is that not an indication that, that they knew something was coming and they wanted to preserve that knowledge? So would the same potentially apply to other structures that they were hidden to, to preserve them for the event that we needed that information which was locked away in these structures. Yeah. Yes, just don't know. Um, speaking of roads, though, you know, there's evidence of ancient roads and they seem to be very, very straight versus the roads you find, say, in the Middle Ages. Um, and and they, I guess in parts of Europe, they call them Roman roads, but we now pretty much know that they predate the Romans. And then you do find them here in the Americas in some places, though, you know, in parts of the Southwest where there's been very little development. Uh, you can spot them from the air. And what's so interesting about them, uh, a friend of mine used to be uh, one of the uh, park rangers um, at, at, um, at Chaco Canyon, you know, a big area in the Southwest that's rather mysterious. And some of these roads they go along perfectly straight across the desert floor. They're, they're of course, interrupted by places where uh, rivers have formed and ravines and things like this, but otherwise they're, they're perfectly straight. And then they'll come to a cliff and you don't see them on the cliff. And then they're perfectly straight again at the top of the cliff. And this might be a thousand feet or so <laughs> in difference. And so what's that all about, you know? <laughs> Well, and there's also those structures in Africa, you know, South Africa, there's all those uh, stone walls, which, which, I mean, they, they claim that it is where the farmers keep their, they used to keep their, their livestock, which is an, totally absurd, because the length you go to to build these structures, you know, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. But yet they're all over the place. And, and again, well, probably from a, a civilization that we know nothing about. So, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. So how how so when you you know you've been doing this for for quite a long time now, 
how do the mainstream scientists and archaeologists react to to this idea? Has it changed over those you know, 10, 15 years you've been doing it? So it's, um, it's almost like voting for Trump here in the United States <laughs> in that there's actually a lot of people are for him, but, it, but people don't like the way he communicates or certain things. And so they, nobody wants to admit that, that they're for him. <laughs> and so I think, think it's somewhat that way that, uh, you know, that this, these ideas of, of a cycle of time make sense and help us make sense out of certain history and myth. And uh, they're a solution in many ways, but it's not accepted in the mainstream. And therefore you can't admit uh, out loud that you're for these or you could lose your uh, job in the, your college or university and these sorts of things. Um, but people are slowly coming out of the closet, if you will. And, and, uh, and we have, you know, more of these showing up at our conference on procession and ancient knowledge. We actually have one coming up this October 4th to 6th at the uh, Marriott Hotel here in Newport Beach, California. Um, and and we're, you know, uh, some mainstream guys, some some not so mainstream guys, but one one person speaking is a dentist, and he's uh, he's noticed that. Uh, ancient jaws didn't have crowded teeth like we have. So you, they didn't need braces as often. And uh, he's also noticed that they didn't uh, need their wisdom teeth pulled. And he's wondering why this is, you know, if we're, we're so advanced, why has our bodies, why have our bodies, uh, you know, gone in reverse, so to speak. And so he's looking into diets as a way to explain it. So, it could have a per perfectly a traditional explanation, but it's uh, it's almost hearsay to talk about the idea that we were better, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago than we are now. Well, I, I remember in, in your book you talked about the it was it Sumerians where there is evidence that they performed complex operations and and they used to drill holes in people's heads and I mean that, that is astounding. Yeah, trepanation, and then of course uh, they found those skulls in Pakistan. I believe there's 13 skulls, 8,000 years old. Uh, there's, and nobody noticed for a while. Then they realized, oh, these rear molars have been uh, drilled and with different size drills and such fine dentistry that the enamel didn't break off. And how did they do that? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but and it comes back to this idea that uh, that we have this pre preconceived idea that it has to be worse in the past, and you know, slowly but surely, that the tide is turning in terms of more and more evidence is being uncovered that that that's just simply not the case. But, I, I agree, and so we'll probably have some big paradigm shift at some point in the future, and I hope we can speed this along. By the way, if any of your listeners are uh, interested in coming to CPAC. Uh, I uh, hope you can let them know. Our, I'll pop a little up on, yes, on the screen for yeah, you. Yes, it's cpakonline.com. And that runs from the 4th to the... 4th to the 6th, yeah. A bunch of scientists come together, and and uh, we used to do just ourselves, and then we started inviting the public. And so there'll be uh, you know a few hundred people in the audience that there's a, a movement building that wants to figure this thing out. Yeah. So... I mean, a lot of the, the stuff that I've covered is to do with the electric universe. Um, and there is, in the electric universe, there's the concept that, you know, our solar system um, follows what they call a, a Birkeland current, which would be, you know, all, all, if we look at the, the arms, spiral arms of the galaxy, they all move towards the center of our galaxy. It's a very slow migration, but slowly the stars move in that direction. And... Um, there is this model that that uh, effectively, and we, we see it in some of the uh, the nebulas. There is the the helix nebula, which is like a twisting, looks like a DNA strand, and we know that they the effectively what happens is the stars will tend to follow these these twisting pairs. 
so so another concept to explain the the procession um, why it would turn would be the fact that we're moving within this and our movement takes us in and out of this much bigger uh, uh, flow but again it still employs this concept of uh, you know, electromagnetic waves and magnetism as you move in and you move out so again the similarities between the the, the two concepts are are striking I mean the only difference is obviously one is bound by gravity and, and one is an electric force but I think there are overlaps in terms of the implications that that it has for you know the fact that the yuga cycle is real and the fact that we can see that there is an effect on you know uh, the, the human brain or the human evolution over a fixed time period which takes it in this this up and down cycle i, I don't know if you you were aware of that's one of the videos that i i'd covered previously Yes, I've really enjoyed reading about the electric universe, and uh, I'm I'm no expert in it, so I'll I'll let the scientists figure that out. But I, yeah, I'm I'm looking for explanations. I do find it fascinating that, um, you know, just with the Earth spinning on its axis, and we get waxing and waning light every day, and our bodies have adapted to that, and so we go into a subconscious state at night. And we're, of course, in a conscious state during the day like we are right now. And like right now, we've almost forgotten our dreams or completely forgotten them. And it's it's a different world that we don't think exists. And yet when we're in our dreams, we almost completely forget this world we're existing in right now. And um, and we you know, we can do much different things. And, and so if if you have that big a change in consciousness, going on every single day, uh, how much of a leap is it to really say there might even be a long-term change in consciousness over 24,000 years or, you know, every 12,000 years? So it's it's very possible. And yeah, I would love to uh, see how the science develops to explain it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think these are, as you say, exciting times as we discover more and more about this. Are there any things that you are working on, uh, you know, at the moment that uh, uh, would help uncover more of this? So uh, I, I was up at uh, JPL the other day, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory associated with Caltech here in Southern California, and um, looked at, you know, uh, some of the uh, space probes that they've sent out. And I'm, I'm sort of fascinated in, in potential evidence of our solar system moving. And the, the action of Pioneer uh, 10 and 11 is kind of strange. The action of uh, Voyager 1 and 2 uh, is kind of strange, you know, as they get towards the very edges of our solar system. Um, it seems like our heliosphere is not such a sphere after all, it's more sort of bullet shaped. And so I think there's, to me, understanding the, the astronomy, the, the, the physics is sort of the linchpin to this. If, you, if people understand there's a, a real cause that could cause a change in ages, then they'll buy more into uh, looking at history and anthropology and archeology, span paleontology differently uh, than they do now. And so, yeah, I'm I'm super stoked, and all the findings going on uh, with the uh, the dwarf planets and their orbits, and all the perihelions are on one side of the sun. It's just uncanny. And uh, my latest area of research is on resonances, uh, mm -hmm. and and um, you know, planets and moons f fall into resonances and. Uh, so that they don't kick each other out of the solar system after, and that's how solar systems stabilize. And so our, you know, our Earth and Moon, they're in resonance. We always see the same side of the of the Moon uh, facing us, and it takes the least amount of energy to perpetuate that motion. Or Pluto and Neptune, they're in a three to two relationship, um, and. It, it appears that many of the new dwarf uh, orbits they're finding are in some sort of resonance. So that's what I'm focused on uh, right now. 
Awesome. Uh, did you see this week as well, the, or was it last week? Uh, the um, I, th- I think they've classified it as a comic, comic Bori. What's it called? Borisov. So, are you aware of the Amuamua, the the what they called it, an extraterrestrial uh, object that they they some thought might be a spaceship that entered and went past the sun? Well, I think this week or last week, it's yeah, it's called Comet Borisov, and it's what they call as an interstellar visitor, and, it, and it's a proper comet, whereas the Amuamua was a bit of a strange object in terms of its movement. It didn't behave exactly as we wanted to, and the interesting thing about the the comet. Uh, Borisov is that it is not gravitationally locked to the sun but it is following an elliptical path but a just much much larger elliptical path so again implying that yeah okay it could be on a random trajectory out of nowhere or it could be locked into an orbit about something else <laughs> much much further out but hey could you know, be. Well, yeah it could be indeed yeah well we're gonna figure that out yeah no exactly um, if people want to know more about the um, your sort of idea on on the, you know the lost star and and the, the notion with Sirius, where can they go to find out more on that? Obviously, the CPAC that you've talked talked about. Yes, this conference on procession and ancient knowledge that we hold each year is a is a fun way. I mean, if you happen to be in Southern California, uh, please attend uh, and just go to cpaconline.com. Uh, but also, uh, you can just read, uh, you know, the book Lost Star of Myth and Time. It's also on Kindle and Audible and things like that. That's that's a way to find out more. Or write us here at uh, just Walter at the Binary Research Institute. And uh, we love, uh, there's so many people working on this from so many different angles. And I would love to get those emails and uh, just try to correlate things. But you also have on on the website there are lots of articles as well that you know if people want to know more there are uh, there's stuff on your website as well. That's true. Yes, at the Binary Research Institute dot org. Awesome. Well, Walter, thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And uh, you know maybe if we uncover some more gems, then maybe we can do this again in the future. I would look forward to it. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you very Appreciate much. It. Thank okay, you. Okay. Bye.